when you were a child, were you also into Hot Wheels or there was like some other uh, things that, that uh, were interest of you? Um, as far as I can remember, um, I, th- I think most boys grow up kind of liking cars. And then as they get older, they either go that route or they don't. Um, I was pretty much in there the entire time. I loved cars. But the one thing I loved more than cars uh, growing up was video games. So like Super Mario was like my big thing. Um, cars was almost like a, like I liked it a bit, but it wasn't a, like a, a crazy passion. Definitely electronics and video game was like probably number one. Um, and then when I moved to Florida, which is when I actually got to live with my father, got to spend time with my father's side of the family, that's where I really got into cars because uh, they all the old BMWs or Mercedes. They always put wheels on it. They always slammed it. They always put some music on it. Um, they always worked on their cars, cleaned their cars, you know, two, three, four times a week. I mean, uh, uncle of mine was a fanatic. He would take off each wheel to clean it every time he washed the car, take the entire wheel off. So that's when I really got into cars, like really, really like big time stuff. As a kid, I was more into like exotics and stuff like that, like un- unobtainable cars that were really hard to get. And I think most young kids are really into that. But then as I grew older and got to spend time uh, with like, I guess, reachable goals, like these cars that my father and my uncles had. That's why I really, really started to like it. So th- that's the, your connection to the BMW world. That was like the reachable goal in the beginning, and that's how you got into the, the BMW. Or is there like other reasons why you're so drawn to, in, at the first place, to the BMW? Um, interesting story is uh, so I'm really drawn into BMWs. My uh, uncles and father only own BMWs. Um, but my first car wasn't even a BMW. I was a big Japanese car fanatic. So my first car was a 1992 Acura Integra LS, you know, VTEC. And uh, that was probably my favorite car. It's my first car, but it's like one of my favorite cars to drive. It was so like light, nimble, and it felt very fast. It didn't make a lot of power, but it just felt all very, very fast. Um, and then, you know, got that car for $3,000, gave it a, like a very cheap $700 paint job, slapped some chrome wheels on it, lowered it, cleaned it out. And that was like my favorite, favorite car. Took it to high school. i uh, very happy with it. Did some really stupid stuff with the car, um, but never really got into trouble. And then a, one day I was driving the car and somebody kind of uh, turned into my lane and the car got totaled. It was a fender bender, but it was such a cheap car the insurance wouldn't pay for it. So they just totaled it out. And then from there, I moved on to a 1999 Honda Civic, S, uh, not SI, I'm sorry, EX. And then I, I did a little bit more, had a little bit more disposable income at that point. So I put wheels, I did some headlights, stuff that I would kind of consider ricey and just not very appealing. That's what I used to do to that car. Um, I didn't do the chrome taillights, though. That's one thing I wouldn't do. Uh, did the music, uh, you know, a little small stuff like side emblems. Um, I did a little trunk spoiler and stuff. And then that car got vandalized, and then I lost interest, got rid of that car. And then I finally got my 2008 BMW 335, which I couldn't afford, by the way. It just took a major, major chance and just decided to roll with it and uh, ended up being, like, probably the, one of the best decisions of my life. I kind of noticed the trend, like some of your cars get totaled, some, some of them get vandalized. Like what has been like the biggest uh, accident you've ever been to? Like have, have, have there been like any like health concerns for you, like or safety concerns, like in any of those accidents or basically it was just the car? Um, the Acura Integra, um, I guess it wasn't too bad. It just, they hit the passenger side fender. Uh, it wasn't too bad. So, I mean, that's the one car that probably wasn't safe in, in any major accident, but it was such a small hit that it didn't really do anything. Um, and then the 335, actually, um, the, the 2008 one, I got rear-ended um, at one point. Just the bumper got messed up, so we went ahead and uh, got a new bumper and rewrapped it. Um, but that one caused, like, two bulging discs in my back. Um, and I had to go through like three or four months of just rehabbing and trying to get that fixed up with a, a chiropractor. And then the most recent one was the Frozen Black M5, which you guys are very familiar with because that's when we first agreed on working together for the exhaust. Um, that was the hardest hit like ever, but I was not hurt at all. Like not a single hospital visit, not a single pain or anything. And I got hit directly in the – like my, my car hit the tree like directly on the driver's side door. So – that car is just very, very safe, very strong. And I don't think any other car I would have left unharmed like that. Yeah, uh, once you told me about the accident, I was so pleased that nothing happened to you, like you, that you were safe. It's just only the car. 
Yeah, I was just mentally, I was just mentally in shock. But um, it it was one of those things that I was more, I guess, mentally hurt than anything. And I honestly, no pain. That car got wrecked. It had thirty six thousand dollars worth of damages, and absolutely nothing happened to, happened to me, which is insane. I was the only one in a car, by the way. But yeah, that was the biggest accident. After that, kind of learned a really big lesson. Haven't really got into any other accidents after that. What's what's the lesson? Um. Well, <laughs> how do I get into detail without getting too much into detail? <laughs> um, I guess I guess the, the the answer to that is, especially with like modern cars. You know, like especially these BMWs that they come with so much power in their rear wheel drive is that you just got to respect the car. Like, I guess before trying to do what I try to do, um, maybe I should have got a little bit more used to the car and a little bit more used to the power at a lower gear before attempting what I try to do um, and maybe doing a little bit more research on what I try to do. Because I was actually trying to perform a... Um, something that's offered by BMW in their cars from factory. I've never, never done it before, so I struggled with it. And then, yeah, yeah, pretty much just a little bit of research, a little bit of respecting your uh, car, and I guess go in stages. Just don't go full send, all, like, you know, right off the back. Don't try to do something. I guess the first time you try to do something that you think is a little bit risky, maybe just don't do it the first time. Kind of ease into it. I think that's a good advice to everybody listening to right now. Like, don't do it the first time. You can eventually... You know, get up to that, but probably do some practicing first. You know, it's funny is if you if you look at me not like if, if obviously I don't do a lot of this stuff on video, obviously because I don't want to be like a bad influence. But um, if you if you look at my driving skills now compared to when I crashed M5, I I mean I can do war, I can do far more riskier things than that, and I I'm in total control. Like I really took time to to you know uh, learn my cars and reach out to people that are a lot more skilled. To figure out what I did wrong, what could have been avoided, how can I correct the problem, or whatever it is. So now, like, I, I got like this new, I guess I got more more of a skill and more of confidence to to with these cars because the silver M5 that I have now is much much faster than the black one, and I'm doing way crazier stuff with that car, and I can easily control it much better than the black one. So now, the super. And uh, like, how does that compare to the other cars? Like, there's a lot of BMW elements in that car. Like, does it transfer everything? Like, or do you have to learn something new uh, related to the to the Supra? Uh, it was a pretty easy transition because, obviously, like you said, it's primarily BMW when it comes to the drivetrain, right? A Z4, same chassis. Yeah. I, I would say just the looks is what's different, right? So it, gives, it has more of a Japanese appeal uh, to it. But as far as like, it was an easy transition because, you know, working on the Supra is like working on a B58 powered BMW. It's very, you know, it's a lot of the same stuff. Uh, you know, my partner, Ali, good friend of mine, Swap Depot Channel, he uh, he's very familiar with working on those cars. So it's very easy to, you know, if I don't know what I'm doing, you know, he can give me a hand or he can help me out or he can actually do the whole job completely. So I think it's just a lot of the resemblance to BMW that's easy, that was easier for me to get into. I mean, even like the little, uh, the bong sound when you leave the door open or something like that, it's the same as BMW. Um, the infotainment display, the iDrive um, system is all the same. Obviously, the engine, the sound, the A-speed automatic transmission, ZF, is all the same. Uh, what changes is just like the aesthetics, steering wheel, seats, dashboard style outside of it. Um, and that's about it. Uh, but I felt like this was like a good middle ground to like open up to other cars. It's like somewhere in the middle. So you told me that you had a JDM influence before. And are you, are you planning to do anything crazy regarding the looks? We know that Japan, you know, they do crazy exterior modifications to, to their to their cars. Are you planning to do something in, for, in, that, in that way? Um, it's... So it's hard for me to do anything crazy. I'm very conservative. I like a very OEM plus look. Um, but I think the Supra kind of deserves to go a little bit, you know, outside of the box. So I've looked at some pretty <laughs> massive wings. Um, I think the wheels are pretty conservative. You guys see that pretty soon. We'll probably get it installed in like a week or two. Um, but yeah, I'm planning to go pretty crazy with the outside. Hopefully, I'm not gonna go wide body though. It's a it's it's a fairly brand new car, five thousand miles. I don't want to slice it up. Um, but 
big wing is probably going to be the craziest thing I've ever done in any car. I don't do big wings, but I feel like that car can, can pull it off. <laughs> so that's probably the only thing I'm going to do. And then obviously we'll do like a big, hopefully, you know, what I'm, what I'm planning at least is a big turbo setup. I'm just waiting to, to tune the DME, but, um, you know, to try to make it sound as close as like the iconic two Jay-Z as possible, if that's even, you know, a thing. Right. Would you ever do underglow? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no. I, you know, I've, I've thought about it. I can't pull the trigger, man. It's a battle in my mind when it comes to, like, outside of the box stuff. And that's just something that, I don't know, maybe I'd do it. it it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's tough to do something that you're not comfortable doing. That's all. So, like, the F30, it's been a slow process with that car. But that car is getting a wide body. And you don't understand how hard that was for me to even go that route but i decided to try it because once you try something new that's like out of your comfort zone it becomes easier to try crazier things after that you just got to get the first few ones out of your system and it actually becomes easier um so i so it's not installed yet but i'm looking to get it within a month or so i'm, look, I'm waiting for inventory to be filled up um i just I, i'm going to be really honest with you guys the reason I even decided to do the wide bodies because I'm not keeping the car. I'm going to give it away. <laughs> so I figured it wouldn't be my car anyways. If I would have kept the car, I probably wouldn't wide body it. But I just feel like if I wide body it and then make the excuse that I'm giving it away, then I can go ahead and do it and not feel bad about it. But do some super wide wheels, maybe some air suspension. Uh, do, all stuff, do all the stuff that I normally wouldn't do so my cars and then just do it as a giveaway. And I still think there's a market for that out there. Obviously, those are the type of cars that get a lot, a lot of attention. Uh, when you do wide body, like uh, uh, Ali from Swap Depot, when he wide body his red E90, dude, that car gets more attention than my blue one. Even though my blue one has probably double the money put into it than his car, his gets a lot more attention because it's just different. No, but a lot of people don't do the wide body. It's just something that's very different that you don't see, you know, very, very often. Is it a secret uh, what brand you picked or you just you're just going to keep it a secret for now? uh yeah i'm gonna hold on to that to that i know it, there's only one brand that i'm working with but i'm gonna hold on to that okay okay until, well, until, until, I, until i have it like it, when i have it in my possession because i'm working with a company once i have it in my possession then i'll talk about it sure um i think everybody listening right now is kind of a little bit excited is the giveaway to usa what was that like the giveaway are the participants limited to usa residents um, yeah, I, what I did with the E93, which was an experiment, I did it for the first time. Um, we did, I think we did United States and Canada. Excluding Quebec, Quebec people, please do not hate me. It's just something okay. legality-wise. Yeah, I mean, oh, something legality-wise, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm not I'm not super big like Adam LZ or anything like that where you can afford all these legal fees and, and get other countries involved and all that. I don't have that. I don't it just it would take too much money even to start it off. It's already a lot of money to just start the giveaway for US and then if you want to include certain countries, uh, I mean certain states like California, New York, then you need permits which is an additional cost. We're talking about 5 6 6000 just to get the legal stuff to start the giveaway. So you start off with $6000 like in the hole. I can only imagine adding other countries and stuff. It'd probably go even higher than that. So I just, I wouldn't be able to do it. At least not now. But, I, you know, it could be in the future if I ever, you know, if, I'm, if the brand's a lot bigger. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean, mean, I think that, that, that sounds like a very exciting project. Uh, very looking forward to it. Like, what's the timeline? When can we expect uh, the video to drop for the Vibe Bonnet? Uh, well... If you guys uh, watched the, the F30 video, we recently found shavings in the filter. So we're going to do the rod bearings first and do the maintenance before we get into anything else. Because that was like a big thing we weren't planning to do, but now we have to do. We sent on all analysis, which I'll give you guys a show, share with you guys the results in the upcoming video. But that kind of set us back. We don't want the engine to blow up. So um, I should get the wide body within a month. And hopefully the maintenance is done by then. So we'll start installing it. I would say I would say August, either late August or the beginning of September. Well, cool. I mean, that's definitely something to look to look, look out for. You did mention something interesting was that or your beginning inspirations was gaming, and because we're doing this on Discord, it's really like first started for gamers. Uh, recently, I and Joe were having a discussion about old arcade games, 
Um, what what game was it, Joe? That uh, it was re- the one that you really liked playing. Oh, it was called Initial D. Uh, uh, I think it's second gen. Yeah, it was Initial D second gen, and I fell in love with it so so quickly. Did you have, Did you have, have any like games that you like to play? Well, to this day, if I ever find a Pac-Man arcade, I'm 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 on that all day. But it has to be the classic. It can't be Mrs. Pac-Man. I got to do the original Pac-Man. Um, so that was like a big one for me. And like I said, the very first, the very first Super Mario with the square controllers. That was that was that was it. Oh, and, and obviously, uh, uh, Donkey Kong, the one with the barrels kind of going down the the metal plates or whatever, like the very classic one where you're you're supposed to go all the way to the top without hitting one of the barrels. Um, but that's about it. That's as far as I can remember. I did that. I did a Super Mario. Did Sonic. I did. Uh, I did a little bit of Tekken later on, and then uh, yeah, that's about it. I didn't do really anything. I was like, not that I can think of right now. Super Mario was the one I like invested my life into. It. Like I do the shooting ducks with the little gun and everything. Uh, I never got. I, I never did like Atari or anything like that. I never really went that far back. Yeah, I remember the, the shooting ducks. That was a. That was something that I put a lot of hours into. Yeah, I I really put a lot of money. But it's weird because I grew up playing video games, but my mom hated it so much that every time she was cleaning, I somehow always came home and the video game system was broken. She said that she dropped it by accident. And I think she just didn't want me to play it. But my father would eat, my, my father didn't live with us at the time. He was, you know, he was elsewhere in New York and he would always send me a new unit, but it wouldn't last that long because they would accidentally get dropped every time. Accidentally, rough, rough yeah. childhood. <laughs> rough childhood. <laughs> Are you dropping your kids' games accidentally? No, no. He's actually um, he he's he's actually quite the opposite. He doesn't spend a lot of time on like the only tab that I gave him. He broke it within like two weeks, and I was like, right, well, no more for you. So um, he just kind of plays around with his toys. He goes out and rides his bike, and the only thing that he does excessively, I guess. Um, Kind of passively is like a little bit of TV here and there. But other than that, he doesn't play any games. I'm sure once he gets older and he finds out these kids are playing games and stuff like that, or that his father plays games at night, I'm sure he'll get into it. Definitely not against it, though, because I know how much I enjoyed it when I was a kid. But I feel like there's always, you know, room for uh, just a balance. So I would also like to, uh, to know, and everybody else, I think, uh, listening in, how did your YouTube career start? And how did you decide to do YouTube? So, so I came to Florida. I was 15 years old. Got a first job at Universal. I was working, um, working at attractions. Worked at Jimmy Neutron. I was doing the chicken dance for people. We're talking about like 30, 40,000 people who would go to the parks and watch me do the chicken dance. So I worked Jimmy Neutron and then worked at an attraction, worked uh, Twister, from there, I'm telling you this because it's the backstory that's gonna it's gotta all make sense. I did Twister, I did like Men in Black, Jaws, and then from there I transferred over to guest services, um, where I guess I learned people skills and I learned how to talk the right way. Because coming fresh from Rhode Island, I didn't speak very well. I mean, like I spoke it well, but it's very ghetto. So I did guest services. From there, I met some guys at the theme parks that were selling timeshare. I got into timeshare, made the most money that I've ever made. Um, but then I just got tired of. Uh, the micromanaging, just the uh, the same lifestyle every day, 40 hours a week, like the rat race. It just felt the same. Um, I didn't like having a boss. I didn't like waking up at six o'clock in the morning. And then um, I wanted to do something else. I just wanted to do something else beyond just the regular stuff every day. And then one day I went to work. There was a guy that I guess he was being trained. He was being trained, quote unquote, he was being trained. I, I needed to train him. Um, and after like a few weeks of training him, I realized that he wasn't there to be trained, but he was in there as an investor to, I guess, invest into the company, but see how it works from the inside out. So I became friends with him. He kind of opened up my eyes because he was like, like he retired at 35 years old as a millionaire, kind of opened up my eyes and I guess allowed me to think a little bit more openly with just, I guess, entrepreneurship and stuff like that. Um, one day I was playing basketball, which is one of the biggest passions that I had. I played basketball twice a week. Um, I was playing basketball, injured my ankle, and I was in bed for a few weeks. And I had a lot of time to think there. And while I was in bed, I was watching a lot of YouTube channels, a lot of YouTube videos and stuff like that. And then I was seeing how some of these YouTubers were making a living off of it. And I was like, man, that would be really cool. I don't really, I don't really have a lot of friends to talk to about cards and stuff that I'm really into. What if I start a channel and find a community that really appreciates what I appreciate? 
Um, so while I was like there, uh, three, four weeks, just in bed with an injured leg, I couldn't really do anything. I started like, I guess, uh, starting on my first video, like I started outlining ideas and stuff like that. And it was like, the, the video title was how to buy a used car. That, that was the title. So I started doing research, started doing an outline. And then, um, I decided to just get, get a camera that we had just kind of sitting around an old camera, propped it up on a tripod that we had. And I started recording it. The video took about 43 hours to make. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. It took 43 hours to make. It was a 20-minute video, I think, something like that. And I never published the video. I was too scared to do it because I was afraid of being judged. And I never published it. My wife was like, just publish it, just publish it. Everybody's going to love it. I didn't like it. It was cringy. And then I went to sleep and then found out the next day that my wife published it for me. And that's pretty much how that started. If she didn't publish that video, I probably wouldn't be doing what I do now. Um, yeah, so she kind of like a big, you know, so she's, we, we've been uh, together for over 10 years. So she was around when I first started, which was 2018. That was my first video, January 22nd, 2018. Yeah, she uploaded it that day. And then that video got 300 views. And that kind of gave me like the, the motivation, I guess, the, the belief that it can be possible. And then from there, I, I, I did YouTube doing like regular list videos, like type of videos that appeal to a lot of people, like top five videos, type five, top five cheap cars, top five sleeper cars, Japanese cars, European cars, stuff that really appeals to a massive audience. Um, but it wasn't really doing so hot for first six months. I think the first six months I had like 30 subscribers and I was get, getting like 10 views a video. And then six months in, I uploaded one video that went viral. I think it was like cheap cars that make you look rich under $10,000. That went viral. Second video, I did a follow-up video to that. It went viral. Did a follow-up video. Went viral. So from six to eight months, I went to like from from like 30 subscribers to 75,000. And that was it. That's I applied for monetization. I started getting paid. And that's how that career started. That That's also the, the one ones that I first found you on YouTube. Yeah, I'm sure. So it, it's crazy because um, most at the time, like I would meet random people everywhere. They were like, dude, I just bought my Maserati because of your video. <laughs> and I was like, what? Because those videos have like millions of views, which I guess brings me on to the next subject is most people ask me, why did I stop making those videos that got me millions and millions and millions of views? I just I wanted to get in and I, I wanted to start doing something like I guess for myself, like I was, all I was doing, I was spending five, six hours on the internet, looking up information and outlining, and then just getting sitting in my office filming this video. So I'd spend 20 hours literally just doing this video from home, but not really actually working on a car or like knowing what that felt like. So that became like a miserable thing for, to me. And at the time I had that 335 and I made a random list video where I asked people, hey, would you guys like to see me mod my 335? And everybody was like super ecstatic in the comment section and they, 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 they wanted to see that. So then I started doing a little bit of both and eventually I just cut off list videos without telling anybody. But, but I think those videos, those uh, cheap car videos are very informational and also educational. So I think you should yeah, do, they you, are, should they do are. you know, sometimes just every once a year annually and i think because the 2022 you know car market got exploded or some you know get into weird situations so maybe we can see from your insights like a, a genuine car guy you're right and if i were to do that it would probably still stick within the bmw brand um youtube has its weird ways of doing stuff where like if you're let's say you're authoritative and uh and in, in a subject, let's say whatever it is, let's say you just do Audi content and you know you do very well. If you try to switch things up to a different car, something that's not an Audi, your it the video is not gonna get pushed. I know a lot of you guys have noticed like on Instagram, if like let's say well I don't know about you guys because you kinda of post everything, but let's say I post my three thirty five and it'll get two, three thousand likes all the time every time I post that car. If I throw in the Supra, it'll get like two hundred likes because i'm not an authoritative in that space like it's just it, it, these social media platforms find a way to put you in a bubble like they confine you in this bubble where you're kind of stuck there it's even let's say you start doing gaming channel like what was that guy that was doing like fortnite videos and was getting like ridiculous amount of views ninja? but then fortnite uh, yeah ninja he was like he was doing ridiculous and eventually fortnite dropped off and he was still stuck there 
because it's really hard to move from where you got your audience from. And that was the biggest issue I had when I transitioned from list videos to BMW. It was the worst. My my like my income, everything dropped for like four months. It was the scariest thing ever. But I figured if I did it long enough, I would recuperate the audience and find more people that would actually watch the content. It was four months of like, I mean, my I, I took like a 50, 60% pay cut when I stopped doing the list videos, but I just wasn't happy doing it. So I decided to take a three, four month risk and eventually it went back up. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that while I used to get three, four million views um, a month before, and now I only get, let's say, 700,000 views a month. Weird enough, I make I make more money now than I made before just with ad revenue. We're not talking about park sales or sponsorships. Ad revenue, I make more than getting four million views because I have a more niche audience now. Companies know what audience they're targeting when they put ads on my videos. They pay more. It's it's more of a it's more of a um, competitive thing. So now you have ECS tuning in or you have FCP Euro putting tons of ads into my videos. While I don't get as many views. I make more in ad revenue. While if you have a video, five cheap cars that make you look rich, right? You have five different brands of vehicle and you bring in a whole huge crowd, you get paid less per a thousand views than if you had a niche audience. Yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds like, I mean, automotive content is huge now on YouTube, but I'm curious, like when you started, how big was it at the time? And were there any like big uh, automotive YouTubers that you looked up to uh, during that time? I, I, I the, honestly, I never, I never used to watch YouTube until I started done, start, started doing YouTube. I literally never watched YouTube unless it was like a DIY that I was looking for to fix a, a car or fix something inside of the house. I never used to watch YouTube. Once I started doing YouTube, it's when I started looking at other people. And the only reason I started looking at other channels, it wasn't for entertainment, but for more so so I can learn what was working and what wasn't working. So I would find inspiration and I would go to the, the channels and there's like a tab where you can switch over from um, most recent to most popular. So I would look at the most re uh, popular videos and find out why they're doing so well. So obviously the bigger, the biggest automotive YouTube channels at the, at the time was like Daily Driven Exotics. Uh, you know, Vehicle Convergence is very big at the time. Uh, Stradman, um, there was uh, who who else? I used TJ Hunt, Adam LZ. So I used to watch all their videos, especially Adam LZ because he had a 335. So he got he got so many views for me. So I, I used to watch all those channels, not in a way to not for entertainment, but to learn what they were doing that was working. Um, and then after that, I just kind of used everything that I learned, and then I watched a lot of help videos from a lot of these YouTube gurus. And then I just went from there. A lot of it was just, you know, watching videos, being a student of YouTube and just kind of trial and error, man. I think trial and error is just like the best way of learning. Um, and let's say you can find so, like I was never able to find a mentor in that YouTube space. Like how many people do you meet on a daily that does YouTube or social media for a living? Not a lot of people. So it's very hard to find a mentor. And if you ever reach out to these big guys at the time, I had what, 2000 subscribers. None of those guys replied to me. Even when I had 80,000 subscribers, I messaged every single one of those guys never got a reply. I don't blame them for it. Cause I'm sure they get thousands of messages, but it's really hard to find a mentor to accelerate you know, your process in that career. So I, everything that I've done is pretty much all on my own, whether it's editing, camera skills, um, just like everything, everything, everything I've learned on myself. So if that was to ever mentor somebody, I'm sure I can cut their time probably in half or more. And I've actually done that in the past. I've helped five people. Um, and out of the five people, only one person stuck through it, which is Swap Depot. The other guys, they did really, really well, but they weren't getting paid. So they just kind of stopped doing it. I'm interested, you know, like in you, uh, you did mention that there, uh, when you were, once you were working in Universal, there was uh, this um, investor, right? Would you, uh, would you consider their team uh, a mentor in a way? And if yes, uh, yeah. uh, the, sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you off. If yes, uh, was there any advice that he gave you that really stuck? Um, he just made me feel like, can we use curse words here? No, I'm not going to use a curse word. He made me feel like crap. He just, because I was, I guess at the time, it, so it wasn't the universal job, it was when I got into timeshare. I had just bought the 335 and I had met him. And I thought like, I had, I guess I had an ego at the time. I thought I was doing really well. I was going to retire doing that. I had a nice car. And then he came in and he was a lot more successful than me. And he was just, he was just a lot more, he was smarter. He humbled me in a way. Um, and he just kept telling me that that I was just pedaling, whatever that meant. I guess he just said, I'm just pedaling. That's all it was. Like, I'm not getting anywhere. You just, I'm just cruise control. 
um and and then um and then he before he like he left me completely like he he left the company or whatever he just kind of gave me a money magazine from 2001 and he told me to read three pages there and that kind of changed it for me um so that kind of opened my eyes to entre entrepreneurship but the reason like yeah actually yeah i i would say he was part of the reason that i started youtube because he got my brain to just start thinking like to work a little bit more he gave it like the right mindset like after i talked to him and he was the mentor like i started hating my job every day like it was i was miserable after i met that guy um but little small things it was like um he said if you have an idea jot it down and like i remember we were meeting like once a week and he would ask me like what my finances were what i was paying what i was making and i just never had the answer he was like you got to get more organized you got to jot things down write it down if you write it down you can remember it easier um and then he was like you always got to have an elevator pitch you always got to have this like little small things and i think it all added up for, you did mention that you have mentored five people uh, in the past, right? What was the advice that you gave them? And, and maybe you can share it to everybody and they can maybe, you know, learn something or be inspired the same way you were inspired by the, by the investor or make, make everybody feel like crap. <laughs> no, I'm not a big fan of making pe people feel like crap because some people can handle it, some people don't. So it, don't it does work on some people, it doesn't work on some people. Um, I, the the four people that I try to mentor because they were trying to get into the YouTube space. It's crazy. Once you become pretty big on YouTube or any social media, you get people to reach out to you that haven't reached out to you in years, and they all want to talk to you because you know they want to get into it. Uh, a few people I decided to take on the challenge and help them out. And the main advice that I had for all of them is don't do it for the money. Just do it because you love doing it or it's a passion of yours. Because if you're doing it for the money, you're gonna burn out. You're really gonna burn out. And you're going to just hate having to turn that camera on every time it's time to do a video. If you don't see money coming in, you're not going to have a reason to do it. Think about it. I did it for six months. I did 40 hours a week on YouTube and 40 hours a week on daytime job. I did that for 40 hours, so, so 40 hours a week, two videos a week, 40 hours a week for six months. And I didn't get paid a single dime. And we're talking about my relationship took a, a, a dump completely. Everything was so bad. And, you know, all I told my wife at the time, she wasn't my wife, but I told her, I was like, just, just trust the power, trust the process. It's going to, you know, it's going to work out. This is what I want to do. But what I'm trying to say is those six months, um, I didn't get paid, but I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed reading comments and, you know, communicating with the, the community and just being around like-minded and like-minded individuals. So don't do it for the money. Sure. You know, I make a decent amount of money to get these cars and make this content for you guys. But if I didn't like what I did, it would be such a i don't know just it just it wouldn't be as enjoyable and i would probably like it eventually end that's what i'm trying to say like these guys that did really well like that i mentored they in first video got twenty thousand views one guy and another guy got like thirty thousand views in the first video but because they didn't get monetized and they didn't get paid in like two to three months they stopped doing it because they didn't really enjoy doing it they were doing it more for the money and to try to get out of their, I guess, their job situation. So you got to really love what you're doing. On top of that, be a student of YouTube or social media, TikTok, Instagram, whatever it is, like like what I did, you know, look up these popular channels, find out why it's working for them, uh, find out why they're getting the views, why they can make a living off of it, and just kind of try to reverse engineer a lot of that stuff. Because a lot of these guys put public information out there of how they began, how they made it work, and you can kind of find all this information. Um, and then um, with video content, Title and thumbnail is king. Unfortunately, we're, we're in a day and age where clickbait is a thing. You can either do good clickbait or bad clickbait, but you need a really good package to get people to even pay attention. You can have like the best video that you spent, I don't know, 80 hours on, but if the packaging is not good, nobody's gonna watch it. It's the same reason when I used to go to grocery stores to buy a cereal box, to buy cereal, I, I always chose the one with like the, the fancier art, the one that looked a lot more delicious than the rest of them would come home and the cereal was disgusting. But get what, guess what? They got the sale because the box was so good. It was, it was great. So the packaging is very important. And if you can combine that with very good content, then you got a winner. So um, I just look at the and focus on the details, maybe try to reach out to content creators, you know, that are smaller, uh, join groups like Facebook groups. It's why I was, I'm still part of the Facebook group that I started that, that uh, I think it was like Brian G Johnson or whatever. I'm still part of his Facebook group that I joined four years ago. So uh, Facebook groups, forums, Reddit, Discord, stuff like that. The information's out there. It's not like back then where a lot of this information was like private or hard to get. Now it's available. People pretty much have their progress, you know, the blueprints to everything and how everything works. 
try to improve every upload, every post that you do. Try to improve like one little thing. I mean, I still look at two videos that I've uploaded two days ago and I'm, I'm like ashamed of it, you know, because I think like I got so much better in just those two uploads. So just keep improving, stay consistent. And I think the most important one is to um, adapt, which, by the way, I'm having a very hard time doing with the whole TikTok and Reels and YouTube shorts and the short form videos. I'm having a hard time doing it because I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, but it seems that like attention spans are shortening and that's like the way of the of, of like future video. Well, if you're talking about TikTok, maybe you can bring back your famous chicken dance. <laughs> that would probably get 2 million views. But that's the thing. So I have a couple of friends that watch TikTok videos and stuff. You know, like the hilarious ones or the skits. I can't watch it. I can't watch it. I won't tell you why I can't watch it. Because I'm not, a, you know, I'm not going to make anybody feel bad that watches it. I just can't do it. Well, well, uh, just coming back to your advice, I think that, I think uh, Joe also mentioned in the comments, you know, trust the process. You also mentioned that consistency is key, that you have to love what you do. I think those are great advice, either if it's related to YouTube or some other profession everybody, anybody is pursuing. Yeah, and you just have to keep innovating and just really be prepared to bust your ass because at the beginning, nobody cares about you. Nobody knows anything about you. They have no reason to care about you. Like, you have to be consistent. And if you do, like, if you keep improving and you keep working on, like, the packaging, like, the titles and the thumbnails and you keep working on stuff on videos where you cut the fluff out and you make things, like, fast-paced where people can really digest it and they like to, like, you know, they, they want to share the video, you will get that growth. But what happens is that people just, you know, it's like a new hire. When you get into a new job, you got that energy. You do very, very well. And eventually you get comfortable and you get you form bad habits and all that stuff. That's something that you always have to challenge yourself not to do. Um, it's very competitive on YouTube now, way more than it was when I started in 2008. It's very, very competitive. It's still possible to grow. I've seen channels. I've seen one the other day that's only been channels maybe two months old. already has like 400,000 subscribers. It's possible. If you have good content. You know, the algorithm is, it's, is, it's, I guess it's formed in a way that people will find the content. People will find it. You just have to be consistent. You got to like it and keep innovating. You know, I did videos, got paid off for ad revenue from there. I started dipping into sponsorships, like paid sponsorships. That was like a whole new world for me. From there, I started selling merchandise. And then from merchandise, I started selling parts. And selling parts makes way more money than ad revenue. Revenue on somebody else's property. With YouTube, like they can take away AdSense at any given time and you're screwed. So I wanted to make sure I diversify that income. Like, you know, I've had months where YouTube ad revenue is very bad. Like during COVID, it was very weird because a lot of people weren't paying for ads. A lot of views below ad revenue. But luckily, I had my store um, and I had other sources of income. So I guess don't settle for just one thing. Just let's say you got three viral videos and you're making all this money. Eventually, it will level down. And if YouTube decides to kick you out of the program for whatever reason, they don't owe you an explanation and that's it. You lost all your money. You lost your business. So definitely use like YouTube, Instagram and TikTok as a platform to, to for your business. But don't use it as your main source of income. I learned that even though I get less views now, like I said, I make a lot more money than before just because of I started diversifying the income with the store and stuff like that. Just use YouTube as a tool. So I think a perfect example is like Matt Norman from uh, uh, um, Obsessed Garage. Guy makes millions. And he only gets four or 5,000 views on, uh, on each YouTube video, but the guy makes millions. He uses it as a tool to market people to his website. And there you go. He got a sales funnel and he sells a bunch of stuff. So that's how that works. Well, speaking about other YouTubers, you did mention that when you started out at the channel of 80,000 views or uh, 80,000 subscribers or less, you try to reach out to famous YouTubers or big, big, bigger YouTubers at the time. Are there any YouTubers at the moment that you would like to collaborate, do a video on or do a build together, a show, whatever episode? Um, yeah, there's a few people that I wouldn't mind uh, doing videos with. Uh, there's like a new upcoming guy. Uh, like in the 335 scene, a little bit controversial, but he's young and I think he appeals to today's generation. Uh, Wyatt Webster, he's really cool. He has a 335. I've I've sponsored a few things for him. Um, he's up and coming. He's very, like I said, very controversial, way outside of the box and a uh, uh, cool guy. I wouldn't mind making a video with him. Uh, some of the OGs like Jake Spence that has a 135 single turbo would be really cool, which I've met at BMW Invasion. I've also met Thick Whips, which is another guy. 
that I wouldn't mind making a uh, making a video with as well. Um, and then as far as that, like I would say within the community, as far as anything else, I, I mean, I'd be open to it, but I, it's just it's not like I have a want to to collab with anybody else. That's the thing. I know when you first start off, you want to collab with other YouTubers to grow. But uh, for me, I never collab with anybody. It was all organically. Um, but if I had the chance to make content with these other creators, that'd be cool because I think that's something like the viewers would want to see. Um, I try to. I, it's weird enough. I worked when I worked uh, alongside uh, PSI, which is a BMW performance shop here in Florida. I, I used to be next door to Adam LZ for like a year. And I, I, we, we only said two words to each other in a whole year. We used to see each other every day. He was very busy. He's very, you know, he's big. He's always like, um, he's always doing something. So I didn't really want to bother him. But I was next door to him for like a year. Wow. That, that's that, that shows how busy he is. Just two words. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's extremely busy. Always. I would see him all the time, but he was always doing something. So, I, you know, I wasn't that type of guy. I don't want to... A seem or be like that guy that seems like I'm just trying to cloud chase. It was never my intention. It's always that thought that we, we, you know, he's probably gonna think I'm trying to cloud chase. I really wasn't too, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a guy that really like I like to get things accomplished myself, and I'm very prideful. So I wasn't looking to like chase, you know, um, clout from him at all. I just wanted to be cordial and be cool with him because he was right next door, and we kind of had similar starts with the 335. So, so the other YouTubers you mentioned are they all Floridians? Um, no, they're scattered all over the place. But I'm at a point where I'm really comfortable traveling. I was thinking of going to Impact, which is uh, coming up in August. And I think I'll see a lot of those guys there. So, well, That could be an opportunity for you to make some, some videos. Yeah, it'd be cool. I just, I guess, I, like, I might seem very, like, I guess, talkative on video. And I guess right now, but, like, meeting new people, <laughs> that's tough for me. Like, I, it's not that I'm opposed to it. It's just, like, I don't know. I'm nervous inside always. Like, I might not appear. I have a, like, I have a good way of putting on a mask that doesn't seem like it. But, like, when I go to events here in Central Florida, I get, like, approached by so many people. And it's always feels like the very first time. Like, it's, like, so <laughs> nerve-wracking. It's, like, oh, it's, it's a good feeling, but it's just a very, it's a, it's a, I don't know. It's just a bizarre feeling, I guess. That's, that's, that's how you put it. Like, I like it. I, you know, I drive back home thinking about how awesome that is and how people recognize me and stuff like that. But it's just, it's, it's strange, that's all. Uh, can, I, can I have a question? Uh, so I, I just, I was, I was watching your videos and then I realized that your original name, the, the channel's name, it was, it was called Autotainment. And uh, what, why, why it becomes a vehicle virus? And uh, by the way, I, I really like the auto and vehicle virus. This kind of rhymes and you know words playing. That's really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, it was either gonna it's, it was gonna be something that starts with an you know with an A and ends with an A or starts with a V starts with a V. So the word vehicle or auto. Those are like the the roots. I started off with auto tainment without doing research. I just thought it flowed really really cool. I think the hardest thing to do is when you start a business, creating a name, that's the hardest thing to do. But it took me a while, I got auto it, started it, and then like after like my second video, I started doing um, research on like getting the name official, like copyrighted or whatever, like uh, register the name, and started looking up social media stuff. And all the social media ones are taken with auto it, and then I found a company here in Florida that had their business registered as auto it. And I was like, oh, well, that's gonna be a problem. So for like the next few days or so, um, I was trying to get uh, tips and trying to, I guess, um, how do you how do you say, just try to think of names that I can use. And one day I was working at my timeshare job and there was an employee there. Um, uh, her name is Jessie Kay, and she she just came up with the idea and she threw it out there. And I and I like the I don't know if it makes sense vehicle virals, but it just flows really cool. So I was like, you know what? That sounds awesome. And then that's it. I went with that one. It was available on every social media and it was available to uh, to register as a business. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you ever get confused with vehicle versions? Uh, when I first started, I used to get bullied on YouTube for quote unquote stealing his name. Uh, so he was, he was much bigger back at the time, but I would get... Uh, I'd get bullied by his viewers all the time. Every like every video has comments. Oh, good job stealing Vehicle Virgin's name. Good job doing this. Good job doing that. And I mean, I didn't. 
and, and his his name was never the idea behind that. If anything, I, when we created our name, I was hesitant to use it because his name was so similar because I wanted to use VV and he was using VV. So I was actually very hesitant, but I said, screw it, I'm just going to go for it. But I was getting bullied. Um, my intro, I guess, sounded very similar to his as well. Um, so I was getting bullied for that as well. And then there was another channel that I think is kind of dead now. It used to be called Viral Vehicles, and they used to make like list type videos as well. Um, I guess a lot of my views came from that channel because it was similar videos and we had similar names, just backwards. Um, so then he reached out to me. He tried to he tried to threaten to sue me, um, but he was in a different country, so he couldn't do much. And I just stuck my ground. And eventually that channel died. And then I passed him. At the time, I had eight thousand subscribers. He had two hundred thousand, and he was threatened to sue me. And you know now I'm at three hundred and fifty thousand, and his channel died at like two something. Let's say he stopped making videos. It well, very that's strange. consistency. Yeah, it was consistency. I it, it was it literally was consistency and just straight up going through like uncomfortable periods of like no life. I literally had no life. I wasn't doing anything but just working both on YouTube and my daytime job. Is this the path you also suggest to like anybody now wanting to get into YouTube? Yeah, I was kind of obsessed. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, especially if you have a family. I wouldn't go super obsessed because. I took a very big chance. I could have broke up with my girl at the time, my wife, and that would have been a disaster because I really love her. Um, but she stuck through it and she believed in me, even though we used to fight a lot because I would spend 80 hours a week. You know, you, you could only imagine we just started dating. I didn't spend any time with her because I really wanted to get this done. But the whole thought process and the inspiration was to give her a better life. So then if she enjoyed her time and we took more vacations and had more disposable income, then that would make me happy. So... That was, you know, that was part of the motivation. It was just to just just get us out of our. We were broke when I first started YouTube. I was broke as hell. I couldn't even afford like to 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 go fuel up. Like I was asking people to fuel up. Uh, me and my girl used to go to um to the store with a twenty dollar budget. We would pass our budget at the freaking register twenty one fifty, and then I would have to tell her, listen, we got to let go of the whatever Twinkies or whatever freaking uh, sugar stuff she had there. So we had to let it go. Super embarrassing. Like long lines behind us. We didn't have any money. It was like four or five months of just eating like, you know, ramen and stuff like that. Like I was really, really into it. I didn't focus too much on my timeshare job because I really wanted YouTube to work. Like we went through the struggle. So I wouldn't recommend that. That's risky. Um, I would say more of a balance, but I guess just try to improve every time you do try to put time into YouTube and that's it. Even if you upload once a week or twice a month, just go from there. Um, I was doing twice a week. I was super obsessed, and I really wanted to leave my daytime job. And I just—I was a big believer that the more you try, the luckier you can get. And that's exactly what happened. So, she really sounds. Your wife really sounds like a ride, ride, ride or die kind of lady. Yeah, it was. But you know what? It's like now we live comfortable because I, you know, I, the YouTube was good. My wife got inspired by that. She started a YouTube channel. She went viral and stuff. But then eventually she got pregnant, so she stopped doing YouTube. But regardless, now YouTube fueled, you know, she was able to stay home for a year with the kid. YouTube paid for all of that. Um, and eventually she was inspired by, you know, the success that I had. So she started her own business and now we both work from home and now we have like super flexible schedules. And it all started from that one move that I made to like that idea. Like our life would not be how it was if I didn't take the chance and just go through it. It was it was very tough, very very tough. And then I think the second toughest decision was when uh, my son was born. I got fired from that timeshare job because I was editing videos on the job. And then at that point, I had a decision to make whether you know whether I'm gonna go try to find another daytime job or I just go full time YouTube and just take a chance, like do or die completely. It was the hardest decision I ever made. It took me like two weeks to make the decision, and I finally made the decision. And, you know, I, as soon as I made the decision and I started like working overtime, I, I think like a week later, Shell contacted me like the gas station and they invited me over to, to South Carolina to go cover this BMW event. You know, so like if I was working a daytime job, I wouldn't be able to attend that event. And eventually they invited me to Texas to tour their facility for fuel. And then the third time they uh, invited me somewhere else and then they gave me a six month sponsorship. So like. It all went uphill after I quit my day. After I decided to go YouTube full time, so it's just you know everything happens for a reason. I feel like every setback, every you know wrongdoing, every good, everything just happens for a reason. It all, all the stars align if you have good intentions and you put the work in. Eventually, you will meet that goal, but it takes persistence. It, it take you got to be persistent. You got to be very, very consistent, and you have to have the ability to 
to just uh, how do you say to adapt because everything keeps changing technology changes video content the style of everything just changes and you just got to be on top of it that's all well at least it pays off uh, with the ri ri ris ri risky moves right yeah, well, that's one of the things my mentor told me. He used to tell me this every week. It was the first guy that I met. He used to say, how big is your risk tolerance? And every time he would ask me that, I just never answered it. And after like the fifth time of him asking me, how big is your risk tolerance? I just asked him the question. I was like, how big is your risk tolerance? And he said, uncomfortably high. That's why I was able to retire at 35 and why I still have a lot of money coming in passively. Um, and then that's when I got the gist. All right. So you got to take some risk. To get a really like you know to get a really good return not not an easy advice to give out because there's safe ways to make it like relatively safe ways but um the riskier normally the the bigger the return but it can be also the biggest you know the bigger the loss right uh let's move, move back to cars and i want to ask you what criteria do you have for choosing those mods and what modification brings the biggest difference in terms of you know driving experience or any experience in a, in a way um uh so normally before um um before like i'm about to get a car i'm looking for a car um i start thinking of ideas or mods for the car um normally you know we all start the same way we put wheels we lower the car we put an intake uh, if, if you have some expendable money you do an exhaust you do downpipe um or headers if it's an na car but you have an idea but normally at least for us creators and i know a lot of people can relate we have a plan and we never follow the plan because things always happen there's either back orders or something doesn't go right or the car breaks down or you know some unforeseen situation happens where you don't have the money for it or whatever so plans always change or different companies that you weren't expecting to work with reach out and stuff like that so i always have a plan but the at least the 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 the, the first few steps are always the same it has to have wheels and it has to be lowered and it has to have an exhaust and an intake that's it after that it's just you know it's just extra stuff or yeah and like a spoiler and a lip if you can afford it but um I think uh, I think the at least now with all the cars that I have, the most exciting is definitely tuning it and adding like some kind of a free flow system um, because that first drive is just it's just the best. You know when you first get to experience like the extra boost of power or how much you know the car you know how, how much torque the car has or you know how, how loud it is. I think that's like the best part about it. Every time you change a mod and you drive the car for the first time, it's probably my favorite part. That that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, what is your favorite part about you know all from unboxing those you know to the complete build like from from unboxing the parts and then to see the car become complete? It, I think. I, I think. think I, yeah. yeah, I think. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that's, okay, that's okay. That's okay. Um, obviously the best part is the finished goal. If you ever make it to the finish, that's probably the best part. Um, when when I got to finish the E46 M3, that was one of the best feelings ever, especially the way that you know I purchased the car, um, the end goal. Um, and then, like I said earlier, every time you modify the car, that first drive, you do an intake, you drive the car, you listen to it, the exhaust, you drive the car, you listen to it, you do the terrible, you drive the car, you listen to it. Once you can see an improvement, or let's say you do like a front spoiler or a trunk lip, and you take a picture and you can see the difference, like this, just I think it's just the after of every install. The unboxing, I know a lot of people get excited for the unboxing. I mean, I get excited because I get to show you guys, but I'm more so want to install it and see it installed. So like when I did the intakes in the M5, I mean, I was giggling and laughing for weeks because every time I opened that hood, it just it was like so amazing looking. I was like, I was literally always just like laughing. And then the other, here's the, here's the, here's the other, uh, and I promise you this is not a biased story, but when I first installed the full system for the, for the M5, remember this is the first V8 I've ever owned. When I installed the first, when I installed the FI exhaust system that you guys sent me and I heard it rev for the first time, oh my God, I must have like cut 20 years. I turned into a kid instantly. <laughs> like. I was looking for random people that would just tolerate me. Hey, bro, listen to this exhaust. Hey, look, listen to this exhaust. And I'm not a big show off person, but I wanted to show everybody right. what it sounded like. It was it was insane. Like it was insane. I, I, I promise you, like 
if people were around, I found a reason to somehow include the M5 in the conversation where they go, oh, it has an exhaust? Yeah, let me show you. And I mean, it was like that for like two months where actually, if you think about it, even when I drive the car now, like uh, yesterday, I had a good friend visit me from uh, Massachusetts yesterday and he comes to look at the shop and look at the cars and he's like yeah that's the m5 he's like yeah and i show him the hood and everything he's like, all right cool and let me move on to the e46 and now no you guys want to hear what it sounds like and of course like I'm, I'm in there just giggity like laughing because it sounds so good and it's so loud that it's unbelievable so i think that was probably one of my top three like best experiences with like building a car it was definitely the sound of the the s63 was pretty much straight piped with that system it just sounds insane um you have to be outside of the car inside of the car um the the you gotta be outside of the car because inside of the car is like the m5 is so insulated you can't hear a lot of it but on the outside it just sounds like a straight up supercar it doesn't seem like a bmw it, it sounds like an exotic I, I i feel you i totally feel you but how how frustrated are you that cameras or microphones never do the justice right yeah, it's terrible. They can't pick up certain frequencies, so it cuts off the top end. Or, like, if you rev my M5, like, people reply, oh, dude, it sounds raspy. In person, it doesn't sound raspy. It's just the camera keeps cutting it out. I just, there's no way. I tried lowering the volume on my cameras and everything to try to compensate for it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The car screams so high. Like, it's so loud. It's not, like the Super video. If you guys listen to the Super exhaust, it sounds good on video, but in person, it sounds miles better because the top end is not being cut off and, you know, clipped and sounds raspy. So that's the only thing. Like, that would be really cool if somebody kind of came up with, like, a really, really good mic system that can probably pick up all those frequencies without having to clip them. Right, I think the, I think for me it's those rumbles and idle. Those yeah. deep voices gets me every time. No, it, it's good. Yeah, yeah. It's it sounds it sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I didn't expect the super to sound that good too. I thought it was just gonna sound like other B58s I've heard. It actually sounded very good when we installed the downpipe. So um, I'm very I'm, I'm very excited to see what that's gonna sound like once we upgrade the turbo. Well, speak, speaking about petrol engines and the, and the and engine sound, like the EV revolution is coming up. I guess without getting like, like political, um, I would say um, I'm trying to. Ho I've been holding on to ICE vehicles as long as I can. Uh, yesterday was the very first time I was a, I was ever in an electric vehicle. I didn't drive it. I was in it because it was the perfect car to take to get exhaust sounds for the supra because it doesn't make any noise so we drive with we were driving with the supra rental supra so we can get the exhaust shots of the uh, I'm, I'm sorry we were we were driving with the rental tesla um so we can get the shots of the supra since it doesn't make any noise that was the first time in an ev car first time i've never drove one and i'm not planning to drive one anytime soon i want to drive one eventually but i want to film my first reaction to it but anyways um it was so weird that it didn't make any noise. It literally, it's, the car sounds like it's off. Um, so that's strange. Um, as far as like the EV thing, I guess it's beneficial now because gas prices are so high. So I can see that being beneficial. I'm not totally against it. I just, it's not something that I like. But I've also never driven one. So I can't, can't really say I hate it because I've never driven one. I just don't like the idea of it not sounding like a damn, you know, ice engine, obviously. Like, I'm a big fan I mean, of these M96s and these, you know, V8s and stuff like that. Just, obviously, they make a lot more power and they're, they're faster and they're easier to maintain, cheaper to maintain. But I, don't, I just don't think you get that. I mean, I guess if you do a launch control, you can get that smile. But other than that, you're not going to get a smile out of it. I mean, the, the tip about using, like, any of the EV vehicles... Oh, as the rolling car for the for the shoot, I think that's a pro tip for every for everybody. Yeah, that was the first time doing it, and as you guys can, if you once you guys watch the video, if you already watched it, you can tell the super sounds very crispy and accurate because the EV doesn't make any noise; it's so quiet. <laughs> so we actually found uses for EV to record exhaust sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. My my wife is into them. She really wants a Tesla. Um, so you know, like I'm not totally against it. It's just you know, try to hold on to gas-powered vehicles until you know they're obsolete. 
which apparently, uh, you know, which eventually I think they're going to be obsolete. So, so what's the car scene like in uh, Florida? Like, do you notice more of the EV revolution, more people driving EV vehicles, or there's like still like the heteroculture active in Florida? Yeah, it's not like California here. It's not a lot of EVs. You see them here and there. Like you'll see like um, you'll see like a, like a few Tesla Model Threes, Model S, and you know the uh, the Model X and stuff, but not a whole bunch of them. Um, Florida that just doesn't care. You know, we don't even have the uh, emissions test or anything over here. So I don't think people, Floridians really care about EVs right now. There, there, there's. I mean, there's there's a handful. You'll see them every drive, but there's not a lot of them. Um, you see more everything else but that. Well, if there's okay. anybody in the ch- in the chat uh, from California, you know where to go. You know where to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I just. I don't know how that would work here in Florida. We don't have. I don't. I feel like we don't have the infrastructure for it because there's a lot of apartments here and stuff like that. Like, how are you supposed to charge your vehicle? A lot of these apartments, units, or house units, they don't have this stuff. Um, and then a lot of these chargers, you know, they have crazy wait times to just charge, and then a lot of the times the chargers don't work, and then you have to plan your route around it. I'm sure there's positives to it. I'm not gonna, you know, knock it. I just, I don't, I don't think we're ready for that full transition yet. So speaking about the, the future, what's what's your outlook for for your channel, for your brand? What what do you want to achieve, like let's say in five years time? I want to have a team. I think it's something that's really tough to do. I've hired a few people, and you know, they didn't really work out or whatever the situation was. I want to have a team and I want to be able to upload a lot more often. So like four or five videos a week so I can actually get to all the cars. And my biggest goal, which is something I really haven't shared, but I'll share it here, is that I kind of want to hit the reset buttons with my cars. So get rid of 90% of my cars and start from scratch and start and just start with one car, finish it, one car, finish it, one car, finish it, and just cycle through them instead of what I'm doing now where I just kind of keep on, you know, I hold on to them. And then I'm just kind of all over the place. The channel's all over the place. So I definitely want to get more structure, be a lot more consistent, have a little team in place, like an editor or somebody that runs a website so I can just focus on videos. And hopefully do like four or five videos a week, make it very consistent. People know what they're going to, you know, what they're going to watch, what to expect and stuff like that. So in this plan, would you also have your own shop, like where you can do your own builds? So we have we have our shop now that we got into May. Uh, me and Swap Debo, we have a shop there, um, and you know he does he does some side work there and stuff like that. But I have most of my cars on one side. He has you know his cars on the other side and some other, um, and you know some other cars that he's working on and stuff like that. Uh, is it a pub- It's not a public business though. It's not something public yet. I, I decided you know I, I didn't want to I didn't want to step into that just yet. But in the future, you never know. It could be like a public thing where, you know, it's open to the public. But at the moment, uh, you know, he's very selective on what cars he works on. And then, you know, I just do my video stuff. Oh, cool. So in the future, maybe there could be like a vehicle mile shop. Yeah, that would be cool. I just I, I'm just thinking of all the responsibilities I have right now as a one man team. And it's just like there's no way I would be able to handle a public business with a working phone and people just dropping in. Not right now. I would have to have a team. And I would have to have some kind of a manager that runs the shop so I don't have to, you know, worry too much about it. But I definitely would be able to get customers through the door, that's for sure. Because I get messages every day. Hey, uh, is your shop open for business? Is your shop open for cars and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, I think that definitely would be something cool. Of course, you told me you still need to learn more about the business, right? And get a bigger team around you. But I think that's, would be cool to see at least five years time or even longer. Uh, I think yeah. this has been very great, and I uh, I would like to open up uh, the Q and A section for everybody listening right now. I have to say sorry, guys. I'm the first in line, so I have to ask the first. Uh, Christian, what? Uh, just personal question for for me. I I I wonder, what's your bond with your audience? Like, for musicians, their bonds might be lyrics, their musics. For photographers, there there must be you know their photographies. I for as a YouTuber and content creator in automotive industry, what's your bound uh, with your audience? That the strongest bound that you have? Yeah, what's my bound? I don't think I quite understood that question. Like like you create a certain bound with your your 
bond. Bond. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like a like a bond, <laughs> like a bond. Yeah. Sorry if I pronunciation, but yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. No. Oh, what's my bond? Um, I think that I just, I, it's just we're just relatable. That's all it is. Like, so let's like when people like my viewers send me messages, they comment on videos, they mention me. And like they're always, it's almost like an extended family. There's just, it's something that you can't really explain. It's, 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 it's so heartwarming to have people from all over the world just share the same interests, care about you, like both family-wise or car-wise or whatever it is. And like they're so involved with giving you feedback on what to do. I listen to a lot of the feedback that I get, and because of a lot of people's suggestions, certain stuff, like I've been able to complete certain builds the right way because of that. I think it's just one big community and family, uh, just one that I guess I never really had. It's a really, it's a really interesting thing. Like I, like the first, like let's say, um, like very, uh, very old OG viewers still message me from four years ago. I know their names. A lot of times I already know their families because I met them at events and stuff like that. Like, it's I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a big bond with everything. I think it's just like you know, if it's my birthday, they all reach out. If something ever happens to me, like the M5 crash really opened up my eyes how many people really cared about me and it just it's really nice to have so many people that that i don't know they just they care about a stranger that they've never really seen but i guess they've grown with just by watching their videos i guess that kind of answers the question I don't, I don't know how else to answer it yeah that's good that's good sounds sounds awesome and awesome it just feels like a family it just feels like a that's all it is is an extended family like it's like if, if there's a day it doesn't really happen but there's been a few days where i'll never get a, i won't get a message or a comment Dude, I feel lonely as hell, like super lonely. Like I, like I miss these people. Like what? Hold on, my social media must not be working. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> it's Something gotten to that point Instagram where I kind of like. You you what? I, I said you must be thinking something wrong with, with Instagram. Or yeah, Facebook something's account. wrong, and I'm like looking on Twitter to see if like YouTube went down or the servers went down somewhere, or whatever. Because it's almost like it's become like a like a need for me, like to be part of that community and engage with them. Okay, so, okay, so we, we just have uh, another question from the audience. So it's from our user Zero. He wants to know how does it feel when you jump from the Supra to to you to the M5? Like, what differences do you do you notice? Um, the Supra is a terrible daily driver, in my opinion, and the M5 is, except uh, other than the the gas. The M5 is like the perfect daily driver. Um, the Super is just not as practical, and it has a lot of like shortcomings as far as daily driving aspects goes to it. It's a fun car. I love the car to drive and stuff like that and to mess around with. But as a daily driver, it's not the best two-seater, you know, hatchback, and then it's very small. Can't really push the seat back too much, and there's like little small things that the m5 just excels in so the m5 just has everything it has like the massage and seats it has uh you know the comfortable ride all the space um you know you got four seats i can put my my son in the back and uh it's also way faster than the supra at least now not for long but it's faster than the supra it's also v8 so it sounds a lot better and then the engine bay looks a lot better too um but i would say that the supra is more it reminds me more of like you feel more so it's, I guess it's more, it's more of a drive, overall driving experience versus the M5. The M5, everything is suppressed. The speed, the fun is suppressed. Great daily driver, great for like doing poles on the highway, but you don't feel anything. The Supra, you feel everything. I mean, when I was making the video of the launches and stuff, I, you guys probably can see one clip. I, like, I lost traction for like two gears, but it's so much fun to drive. Um, so I would just say the biggest difference is just the sound and the practicality when it go, uh, that's about it. Um, and then the super is just, I don't, I don't like it for daily driving. You can't see traffic lights. You can't see the person when you're ordering food at the drive through um, You can't put your seat far back enough. You don't have a way to open the trunk from the back. You have to use the button on the inside of the door panel, which is not even accessible when you have the door closed. Um, and just little small things like that. I think I got pampered and spoiled with the M5. So going down to the Supra, it's just like uh, comfortable wise. I'm 32 years old not the way to go but for like fun i think the super is a lot more fun yeah i've seen in your videos that uh you mentioned that the visibility on the supra is a downside a big downside like you just mentioned the traffic lights ordering through uh when you're going through drive through um so 
Yeah, I was at a drive thru yesterday, and I promise you, I never got to see the person that was at the drive thru. She was probably looking at my lips the whole time. I don't think she got to see my face at all, and I didn't squat my head to see her at all. And I literally paid for my food, got my food without looking at anybody. That's how bad the visibility is. And I haven't even lowered the car yet. So that's like stock height. Imagine when I lower it. People are going to start looking at the bottom of my chin when I order. <laughs> oh, okay. Just, that's, that's and then I ran, by the way, I'm not ashamed to admit, because I blame it on the Supra, I ran two red lights by accident because I, I didn't even know that, 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 that there was a traffic light at one point. <laughs> You can't see anything <laughs> like what so I was like I remember I came to a hall and I thought it was one of those flashing lights Like pretty much you kind of like you just have to be be you got to be aware when you're driving past it And I completely read a red light because you can't see the top portion. You can't see the traffic light So it's just it's a very strange car when it comes to that. I, I think uh, that should be a valid uh, Excuse for <laughs> running red, you know, the Supra. I mean, yeah, I'm driving a Supra <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's it like I said, it's a really cool car. It's very fast, very nimble. It's just it has its shortcomings, and I'm gonna make a video on it. Twenty things that I hate about it. Yeah, twenty things. I made a list of twenty things, so I'll make a video on it. Wow, twenty things. Usually it's yeah. ten, and now it's now it's twenty things. Wow, okay. That's, I'm uh... gonna do twenty because I'm gonna I'm gonna nitpick some stuff to to piss off the super fanboys. But I think it's okay to nitpick certain stuff because I own the car. It's worse when you criticize a car and you own you don't own the car. I own the car, so I think I have I, I have the right to talk about it in a bad way right. and in a good way. I also found that uh, you were sort of teasing everybody by suggesting maybe you will switch the badge to a BMW badge on the on the hood. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just wanted to troll a little bit. I, I thought about it. I can probably get the because I'll probably get one of these companies to send me a steering wheel, and maybe I'll be like, "Hey, can you fit a custom BMW badge in there?" Just to, I don't know, just to get some excitement and some some exposure. Okay. The next Toyota, my my Toyota's gonna send me a cease and desist letter. Watch. You wanna you wanna <laughs> set set the competitors on fire? That might be a good way. <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> next question is from Noah. And he want to know who's the E90 N50 uh, N54's biggest competitor. And like Wyatt said, it's BMW's 335i. It's the best budget car in, in his opinion. Um, yeah, so 335, they're coming down in price, so you can get them for pretty cheap. Um, Ali just got a wagon for, uh, I think 13 or 14. That's a wagon with an N54 swap. And then he got another coupe 335 N54 for 3,000. I mean, it's a running car. You can get them cheap, um, and you can mod them cheaply to make a lot of power. The problem is that they're not really, like, if you buy a 335, nine times out of ten, you're going to have to do maintenance, and maintenance is not cheap on that car. So it's a good budget car to buy, but can you keep it running? You have to definitely have some disposable income on the side um, because of that. As far as, like, the N54's biggest competitor, it's probably just going to be the modern version of that engine, which is the B58. It's a, it's it's a more reliable. It's obviously been dialed in over the years by BMW. If you think about it, N54 was the first mass-produced turbo engine by BMW. They went on to the N55, right. and then B50 B58 came in, and it's known as one of the most reliable engines. And I mean, Toyota partnering up with BMW on the engine just says it all. They wouldn't put their reputation on the line. So the B58 is definitely probably the n54's biggest competitor if you want to look from like a different perspective then i guess the engines uh in the, the, the infinities q50 and q60s those are the guys that always talk a lot of crap um but yeah that's it okay thanks uh next is also from zero and he said when it comes to the sound quality not how loud but how the overall quality was diff what's different between f f10 m5 and the supra which do you prefer uh, M5. I don't think you could beat the V8 sound. And the main difference is that the M5 can get up into a higher pitch. So if you guys ever heard like these Lamborghinis or Ferraris or whatever McLarens with like exhaust systems, they get like they have a high pitch. It's something you guys are known for, FI. Like you guys are known for like the high pitch. Um, the M5 gets up to the high pitch where it's not raspy. It just it just sounds exotic. Um, and then once you let off, once you let off, like once you rev and you let off, you can hear the turbos whistle uh, coming from the exhaust very, very loud. And I think that's uh, that's probably like most people's favorite part about that car and the exhaust on is that you can hear the turbo spool 
because it has a hot V setup, the turbos are sitting right on top of the, the engine and the manifolds are short, so you can hear all of that coming through the exhaust. So um, as far as quality and sound and loudness, I think the M5 takes the cake. It's really hard to beat that V8. I do want to get an A60 M, uh, M5 with the V10 just to see if I can probably beat out the F10 with that one because that's like a like an F1 race engine or something like that. Uh, so at the moment we don't have any more questions, but I think uh, we can do the giveaway. We uh, for everybody listening right now, we're we're uh, giving out some free stuff. Uh, vehicle Vinyls is gracious enough to give some of his merch, some T-shirts, stickers. I think also air refresher. So we're going to be giving out that and also some A5 merch as well. So uh, there's going to be we're going to put some announcement in the auto space chat. And everybody just, you just need to react with an emoji and that's how you can participate. And we're, we're going to pick out some random winners. And I think if uh, during, during the giveaway, if uh, everybody is interested to ask more questions to, to Christian, uh, please feel free to do so. Now that we're sort of at the end right now, what, do you have any like closing words for everybody right now? Um, just, you know, thank you guys at FI you know, for supporting the channel, helping me out, and inviting me on the first podcast I've ever had. I was very nervous, so I feel like I finally got this uncomfortable thing out of the way so I can probably do it much easier next time. Um, and I appreciate everybody that's tuned, tuned in, supports the channel, and it's been there since the beginning or even recently. Like, without you guys supporting the channel, the brand, you know, buying stuff, uh, it wouldn't be possible for me to one, you know, live the lifestyle that I live and then make content for you guys. So I'm very appreciative as somebody that came from pretty much nothing to, you know, creating this big community on social media. Really appreciative. Thank you. And same, same goes for us as well. Um, we're very happy to be working with you and look forward to more collaborations in the, in the future. So now that uh, you've done your first podcast, so the Joe Rogan experience is going to be next, right? <laughs> oh, man, I'm probably, like, I'm probably like a dust in the wall to Joe Rogan. I got to work my way up there. <laughs> Maybe if I can make a viral video with his name on it, he might call me out. <laughs> I see that, that you prob probably are um, training a lot as well, right? Yeah, I go to the gym every week and I play basketball twice a week. So I would say I'm in pretty good shape. Um, I don't get really tired, and I played three hours of like full core basketball. Um, so that's I, I guess that's one thing I never I didn't get to share with you guys today. I, I kind of mentioned it once, but that's like next to cars, basketball is like my second or like probably first, just like cars as far as like passions and things that I love to do. Basketball is right there with the cars. So that keeps me fit. That keeps me in shape. Keeps me with a good amount of stamina. Um, so it's fun. It's a fun way to do cardio because you don't really feel like you're doing a cardio. You just it's just it's like you're just playing. Yeah, I mean a lot of people hate cardio. Once you get into it, I think then then you're enjoy it. But I think the beginning stages for everybody is very hard. Speaking about the, the basketball, like have you seen the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance? Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing documentary. Definitely, I watch a lot of his stuff. I watch a lot of the stuff from. Um, Kobe Bryant, which was my best, uh, my favorite player, and then I've been watching a lot of stuff that LeBron James has been putting out too. Yeah, rip, rip, um, Black Mamba. Uh, that was very sad, sad news to hear. I, I, I still remember that that day. Yeah, definitely tragic, man. Definitely tragic. I remember the day getting the news from my wife, and I thought she was playing around, and it happened. Uh, you know, rest in peace for to him and his daughter. Super tragic, really good guy, great basketball player, and man, he had a lot going for himself. Yeah, um, I just picked up, there's a question from PJ. Uh, he's asking, what's your dream car? So let's, if, uh, don't, let's not count the cars that you've had so far. Uh, what would be the car next that you would like to get? Like maybe a little bit out of your budget at the moment, but something that you, you would like to add to your collection. So there are a few cars that are like favorite cars and cars that I've always wanted in the future. And surprisingly, they're not BMWs. Um, they're in my budget, some of them. Some of them are not. So um, 
any type of McLaren is definitely like the one. I really want a, an exotic supercar in the future. And I'm a big fan of McLaren. Also a big fan of Porsche because I got to drive a GT3 RS. Um, but I like the Mazda RX-7 FD. I'm a big fan of the Chevy SS, which is what well, it looks like a four-door. You know, it looks like a Malibu, boot, but it's a V8 six-speed manual sedan that makes like 400 horsepower. So I'm a big fan of the Chevy SS. I've always wanted one of those. An RX-7. And what was the other one? Oh, yeah, believe it or not, stepping into the dark side, I love the AMG GTR. So those are probably the four cars I've always kind of dreamed about getting. FD RX-7, Chevy SS, AMG GTR, and some some McLaren, whether it's a 720. Obviously, my main goal would be the one that I'll never get probably, and that's the, the P1. Uh, but, you know, that one keeps going up millions of dollars every year. But, uh, but yeah, those are the cars. And uh, just the giveaway ended. Uh, we have three winners. Well, so it's Mibo, Raymap, 78, and also Wyatt. Those, those are the three winners for, for your. Congrats, guys. Congrats. I'll send you guys out some merch. Yeah, so the Christian is going to be in contact with all of you guys. And uh, that's how you, well, you will, you will basically get down to the details how, how you can claim, yeah, claim the uh, merch. Thanks, just- Franks, whenever you get a chance, just let, send me like a, a screenshot of the three names so I have it on here. Sure, sure, sure. I think we're going to get all the details, you know, and, and pass them to you so that they, they can uh, also rock the vehicle virals brand. So Sweet. now we're also going to be announcing a giveaway from us in the chat, so you can also participate in that. Uh, the same people can also enroll in that. Uh, so we're going to, I think it's live now, so you can uh, uh, go and react to the giveaway so basketball i think that's very interesting to to hear uh because i've watched your content i don't really hear a lot about basketball would that be like a channel like a second channel maybe that you would uh, open up in the future to i don't know share some content about that um if i were to ever start another channel it would be it wouldn't be basketball i watched a lot of basketball channels like the only cable i watch is basketball but if I were to start another channel, it would be it would be uh, a tech channel. I'm a huge fan of tech, or it would be um, a YouTube growth channel to show people how to do YouTube for a living. Or essentially, try to teach people the steps that I took, and try to like you know uh, expedite the process with everything that I learned. So because there's a lot of there's a lot of like YouTube uh, channels out there that teach people how to grow and stuff like that, but they don't have track record or their own success they're just going based on stuff that they they read or whatever i have like a track record and i have like five years of doing it so i can actually tell people the truth of how to get to how i got to my point uh, how, how to get to where i'm at probably like in half of the time i'm like very confident that if i give the knowledge to somebody that just started today i think in one year they can get pretty close to success at least with views and channel growth. As far as business and stuff like that, no, that takes time. I feel like you get better over the years. Like the whole thing with like selling stuff online, that that was like a huge hurdle. But as far as like getting views and getting exposure on YouTube and social media, I think I can teach somebody how to do it in a year. And I think they'll make enough money where they can probably do it full time. Would that be like um, uh, some... Basically, it would be open to the public, or, or or are you also thinking of doing some kind of mentorship programs where like limited number of people can apply to, and then they can do like one-on-one sessions with you? No, I wouldn't do it to monetize myself. I would do it more so to give back. It would be like not a super active channel, but a channel that every once in a while, if I had time, I would just kind of talk about it. I wouldn't charge anything for it. I probably wouldn't even monetize the channel. It would be more so to hopefully give an opportunity to somebody else that, you know, wants to do it. But, you know, a lot of these guys that have really good information, they hide their, you know, they hide all the good information behind a paywall. I don't want to be that guy. I just want to give back because YouTube changed my life and hopefully, you know, I can change somebody else's life. Um, there's like, this This will be sort of like out of the uh, left field, uh, but there's a question by Tattoo Mike and he's asking, would you ever consider of getting a tattoo from him would you ever like do a tattoo on your body and uh, i think he's probably offering for free yeah i've i don't know if that's a 
same gentleman that just offered it to me a few days ago, but um, I'm terrified of NATO, so no tattoos for me. <laughs> okay, that, that, that answers his question. So basically, uh, you have no tattoos so far? I don't have a tattoo, no. My wife begged me to get a tattoo for years and I never got it. What tattoo did she, did she want you to get? A uh, matching tattoo. But, like, that's, like, somewhere hidden. But I was like, uh, you know, that's, that's a pass for me. I love you, but I don't want that. Uh, there's another question from Noah, again. Um, what is DR? Yeah. No, he asked, would you ever plan to visit a uh, vlog or visit DR? I think, is DR, some, is it the state? In Dominican USA? Republic. He's talking, about, he's talking about Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic. Okay. So I, yeah, that's where my family's from. I, I've I've been there, you know, years ago. I've never filmed over there though. It's just if I ever go to Dominican Republic, I just want to enjoy myself. Um, I've never filmed over there, but that would be very interesting. I would I would really need to know somebody in that community uh, that knows about certain car scenes and certain cultures over there because, I mean, where I go visit, it's not it's not the it's not really the safest. So, like, my family's from, like, a country called, a uh, city called Moca. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, like, the wealthiest. It's not, I think it's, like, poor. I, just, I don't think I would vlog anything over there. I don't know. I, I'm never going to say never, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that's something that I'll do. Uh, well, I, that's an interesting question uh, from Zero. The third one. He's asking, would you be willing to... Meet up for a race. Uh, he has the F M5 F90, and he would love to see how it, how it goes. But Zero, are you those from F Florida? Those F90s are no joke. <laughs> oh yeah, he's in California, so I think it's gonna be a long drive. Long drive, so probably pass. I think that's that's probably not happening anytime soon. Yeah, I don't ever set up races, anyways. I get I, I challenged almost every day. People are like trying to. I go to meets and stuff, and people are always trying to race me. But I don't. I don't do that. I got too much to lose. I have a brand. I got a company. I got a family I look out after. So I don't really do that plan. If I'm driving casually, and somebody pulls up, you know, hey, I might do something. But I don't do anything planned. We can take it to well, the track if anything. Well, I think uh, this has been great. I, uh, I would love to, uh, like to say thank you for joining us in our first podcast probably maybe in the future we could welcome you again back you know to speak more about um, your life your builds um, and uh, yeah I also wanted to say thank you to and congratulations to all the giveaway winners uh, we're gonna reach out to you all of you get your contact details and then get, get you in touch with vehicle virals uh, so that's uh, no worries about that um, uh, Joe do you want to say something I just want to say thank you for, for coming in. I am a big fan already uh, after watching all your videos. Not all of your videos, but most of your videos. And I learned a lot from how to talk, how to you know, write script, and how to manage the you know, video going in. That, you are doing awesome. I hope you keep doing it. That's awesome, Joe. By the way, the fact that you were able to find out that my channel was called Autotainment, that is that is something else because I only had that name for one video and you found it. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you everybody for joining and um, then um, see you see you another time, Christian. Thank you guys. Take care. Appreciate you guys joining. Thanks, Frank. Okay. Bye, bye bye. See ya.